Father, we thank you for this day that you've given to us, Lord. Bless each one here today, Lord. And uh, be with those that can't be here. Father, we got we got people all over the place that just need you now more than ever, Lord. Lord, you know what they're going through, each and every case. We got people from coast to coast, family and friends that just really need you today, Lord. And I pray that you send your spirit to comfort them and guide them, Lord. Give us your wisdom that we would make all our decisions the way you would have us to make them, Father. Decisions that would glorify your kingdom, Father. And may we see each other through your eyes and hear each other with your ears, Father. <clears throat> Bless this word today, and I pray that your it would all be for your glory and to glorify your kingdom. And just thank you for all you've done for us in Jesus' name. Let's take a little time in the midst of all that's going on in our lives and worship God and praise Jesus. But I don't know about you guys, but doesn't no matter what midst of trial I'm going through, but just to take the time and lay aside those thoughts and just focus on Jesus, it always helps me. Yes, yes, um, Bill and Kay are able to be here. Sister Kay's got some uh, problems with illness, so they had to turn around. So if everybody could keep her in your prayers, lift her up this morning, and she's feeling better. <coughs>
I just just have a request for the congregation. If you don't already, I had a good friend that's in the Afghanistan right now on a peacekeeping commission uh, yeah. mission. And Monday night they were under fire by some rebels. We had a real close call, and of course they subdued them within a matter of a few minutes, um, overpowered them. So I I would like to see. I do. I don't know whether everybody else does, but to remember our, our military people yes. uh, throughout the world, even though we're under peace conditions, it, and most generally. There is these incidents that happen periodically. And now that we have a member of the congregation that's in the military, hopefully he never gets into this type of situation. But you never know. And uh, at the same time, I also think that we also re need to remember our law enforcement people, our firefighters, our EMS. Amen. Whether you're aware of it, there was over 40 firefighters in the California wildfires that lost their lives. And, uh, you know, it just, it's something that I think we need to do as Christians to support everyone that is supporting us. Amen. Amen. So this is my request of the congregation. Amen. Amen. Anyone else have a testimony they'd like to share? I just want to thank Lord of Jesus, that name, the name above all names, the great I am. Man, every time we hear that name, we should stand up and shout. Amen. It's what he did for us on that cross. And without that, we're, without him, we're nothing. Without his blood, we're nothing. Yeah. We need to thank him 24 7, 7 days a week. I'm just so thankful to be a one of his and have the blood apply to my heart and be able to walk down the street knowing that Jesus is right there with me. I'm so blessed. Amen. Blessed to have a, a brand new church like this little town of Rossville starting up. Mm -hmm. you know, there's churches dying everywhere in this town. Mm -hmm. Little town of America is dying everywhere. Mm -hmm. And I just thank the town of Rossville that they let us come into this building and worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And I just can't thank you enough. Amen. Amen. My heart pounds when I stand up. Um, so to this, I was praying this morning and I just is in just one of those moods, and I come out of the bathroom, and I just can't do. I just I can't do life. I said I'm over it. I, I'm just I'm over life. <laughs> and then I'm like, I don't even know what to wear. He looked at me as y'all wear black. That's your attitude today. <laughs>
I know to hear so much about you that it put something on my heart to encourage you. And I, we were just talking about that Bible study on Friday, how we need to have that eternal perspective because that's the only thing that's going to give us hope. And that's why we that's why we stay doing what we're doing because we know we have a better future. You know, we're just passing through this place trying to make it better. And I, I, I'm thankful for that too. I'm thankful for the words that he gives us and the, the people that he gives us. I was just listening to a song this morning about how the church is just – we can't just come to church. We can't just come to church and complain about the music or the, the, the way in which it's set up or the lack of facilities or, you know, here, you know, we're just getting started. There's so many things that if we just stop focusing on ourselves and what can please us and what can please Jesus, then we can go out and be the church the world needs. Because right now we're supposed to be fed to be able to fill those vessels up so we can go out for the rest of the week and pour them out on everybody. But if we're always just coming in here filling up and not sharing it with the world, then we're going to come up and we're going to come in the next time and not be able to fill be filled up. This is a great song for what we're this is what talking about. It's called My Father's or I think it's my Father's House. But it talks about how prodigals come home. The helpless find hope. Prison doors fling wide, the dead come to life. Miracles take place. The cynical find faith. And don't give up. Don't lose courage about those people that don't change. And that's why I was just talking about somebody last night about this. We had our first youth party. Sorry, I'm chatting this morning. Um, we had our first youth party, and I was talking to one of the girls before, and she was just really discouraged. And she just, you know, life issues and stuff. And, I, and it makes you not want to come. I don't know how you I'm sure you guys have had those Sunday mornings where you just, you're done. You're over it. You don't want to do it. You're not in the mood. And that's Satan. And, and when he's like that, usually good things are coming. But I told her, I said, you know what? We're having this youth party. And our purpose, our sole purpose is to have those youth not have to go through the things we did. Right. We have to just put ourselves our, self, our sides as self. And, and just, okay, we're going to focus on these youth. We're going to pour love into them. We're going to pour Jesus into them. So maybe they don't make as many mistakes as we did. Yeah, sure. And, and, and that's an eternal perspective. That's a whole new way of thinking. That's a whole new way of thinking. And the world just always knew me. How can I help me? Why self help books? But we need to stop thinking so much about that and have an eternal perspective. Mm, that's right. Amen. That's right.
baking soda. Okay, well, my baking soda's in here, but I didn't want to open a new container, but I wanted to all see what it looked like, so there we go.
promise you I would let you try. Here you go. Will you tell me what you're thinking?
And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only thou shalt thou serve. And he brought him to Jerusalem, and set him on a pinnacle of the temple, and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from hence. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee. And in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. And Jesus answering said unto him, It is said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And that when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. I want to talk to you this morning for just a little while about distractions. Have you ever had a problem with a distraction? Within the last 30 seconds, you have had a problem with a distraction. Whether it's someone moving just wrong, or a kid, or you remembering, did I shut the curling iron? Did you shut the curling iron off? I may need a place to stay. Whatever it is, we all deal with distractions in our life. Our life is full of distractions. And there is an enemy that we have. So this is not popular to preach on today, to actually talk about the fact that we do have an enemy. That life isn't a bunch of roses and it's not just glory all the time and your life isn't going to be great. And even people like Sister Angel are going to wake up and they're going to be in a black mood. I have those moments too. If you were here last Sunday, you heard me start out by saying, I don't even want to have church today. That's how I felt. We have an enemy. We have someone that desires us to not grow close to God. We've got to understand that first and foremost. If Jesus had to be tempted by Satan, do you think that we're so high and mighty that he can't touch us? The first thing we have to notice when we start this scripture is that Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit. That's step one. We need to be full of the Holy Spirit. Be, be, before he even went anywhere, he's full of the Holy Spirit. And he was led by the Spirit into temptation. But distractions. You see, we think of Satan and we think, yeah, he's going to attack. And, and, and you, you, know, you picture this cartoon uh, Satan with this picture. This red guy and he's going around poking at you, right? No, that's not him. That's not him at all, actually. If you go into the book of Ezekiel, he'll explain to us what he looked like when he was in heaven. And all these beautiful colors that he had. In fact, it was part of his downfall that he was so beautiful that he had so much pride that it brought him completely out of heaven. He's not the red character with the pitchfork. He is smart. Now, I'm not trying to give him any credit at all. I can't stand him. In fact, I hate him. I absolutely hate him. But he is crafty. And he uses distractions to keep our focus from where it should be. And he did the same thing with Jesus here. So the Bible says that Jesus went out and he fasted 40 days. Now, I have fasted many times in my Christian walk, but I have never done a 40-day fast. I know there's people that have. Maybe some of you have done a 40-day fast. Uh, God bless you for it. I, that is a, an incredible feat. I've went several, several days, and it's tough. If you've ever fasted, it is really, really, really tough because there's this thing inside of you, us bigger people really understand this, that says, eat! You need to eat. Mine doesn't ever shut up, Anthony. He's all the time. Eat. I am eating. Eat more. He's constant on me. But so when you fast, your body's telling you, I'm hungry. You need to eat. You're hungry. This is the same thing Jesus would have been dealing with. Now, I, I've gone seven, eight, ten days in a fast, and you get that far out, and it's like you almost feel like you're just going to die just walking. You have no energy. And I can't imagine 40 days of a fast. And when he comes up, the first thing that Satan does is he recognizes a weakness that Christ has in his physical body. Don't, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying Jesus has weakness. He does not. But he was very much in a physical body that was very much hungry. That's right, right. And what did Satan do? When you fast, we're, we're going to take a side note for a second. I'm going to promote fasting. If you are a born-again Christian and you have never fasted, I highly recommend it. But listen to me. Don't go home and fast because Brother Mark said you should fast because you will fail. Right. Even if some, I've had people come to me and say, Brother, I feel like we need to fast. And I say, I have to pray about it. Because if God's not in it, you won't do it. 
And the Bible tells us you're better off to not make a commitment to God than to make one and not keep it. It'd do us a lot of good to think about that one for a second. But if you've never fasted and experienced that, just sacrifice in your body, letting your body know that, no, you're not in control of me, I highly recommend it, but you pray about it. But Jesus was in this fast, and there's, there's power in a fast. So when you fast from food and you come home and it's time to eat supper, instead of eating supper, you need to go get in your word of God. Here's what happens in a fast. You get several days out into the fast, and for me, when I'm at work, it's fine. I'm just, I'm busy, I'm distracted by work, I don't even know I'm hungry. But when I get home, Zach, and I see everybody else eating supper, all I can think about is food. I get to the point where things I don't even like look like they're good. I look at bananas and say, mmm. I don't like bananas. And when the last time I fasted, I remember walking in the kitchen, and Seth's got this basket hanging on the wall, and here's these perfect-looking bananas sitting in there, and I went, oh, man, I could eat me a banana right now. And I had to laugh because I don't like, I would have scooted it out of my mouth. They're disgusting. They're mushy. They're nasty. The people that eat bananas, they need prayer bad. But what happened was Satan was able to distract me from the power of the fast by focusing on the weakness I had in my body. He seen the same thing with Christ. He looked and he said, you know what, this guy is hungry right now. And if I get him to focus on the hungry, he distracted him with the weakness. Has he ever done that with you? Has he ever got you so focused on what you've done wrong or the one thing you can't do right? I remember we went to a Casting Crowns concert a few years ago. It was down in Indy. And uh, Mark Hall, the lead singer, made the announcement. He said, hey, I'm going back to such and such room. I invite you that if you're a pastor of a church, come back here. I will have a little small deal I want to do with you, and I want to pray over all of you. And Seth and I was like, oh, that sounds great. Let's go back there. And so we went back, and there's probably 50 people in there. Um, and it's just Mark Hall was up on a stage, and he had this little spiel. But I'll never forget. He said, I'm the kind of person that I can have a thousand people come up to me and say, you did awesome. That was, that was the best concert ever. And he said, I can have one person come up and say, you stink. And he said, I will automatically forget about all 1,000 of those compliments. And all I will hear is you stink. We're flesh. Right? That, that's why Sister Angel stands up and says, you know what, i, I got to testify, I'm not feeling it today. That's why Brother Mark stood up at the pond last Sunday and said, I need to let you all know, I'm not feeling it today. We are, we are flesh, we do fail, we do fall short. And Satan, he likes to see that and he likes to get on that and say, okay, now I need you to focus on it. He wants to distract you from the good that you could be doing or are doing and make you focus only on the bad that you have done or the weak points that you have. Yep. We forget all about our strong points, right? Mm -hmm. right. And all we want to focus on are the things that I, I can't do, the things that maybe I'm not good at. Mm -hmm. Right to it. Aren't you hungry? Aren't you hungry? Brother Brian, he's seen it in him, and he knew that this guy right now is, is struggling with this. He came off a 40-day fast. When I did a 10-day fast, I felt so close to the Lord. I mean, it was like I felt like I'm right there. I'm finally getting where I need to be. 40 days with just the Lord? I can't imagine how Jesus felt. And this is God in that 40-day fast and so laser-focused. On God. For 40 days he didn't eat. He didn't drink. He focused on God and God alone. And to come out of that. And the first thing the enemy says is. Hey you hear that? You hear your stomach? Man aren't you hungry? You see I, what he was trying to do? I just came off 40 minute fast. And you're making me hungry. Yeah. <laughs> he distracted him. From the power that he just got out of that fast. Mm-hmm. By making him focus on something that did not matter. He put his focus somewhere into a, a fleeting temporal thing. And took it away from his internal, eternal perspective that Steph was talking about this morning. Distractions. Listen, he will distract you with your weakness. 
That's the first thing I want you to understand. As fleshly people, we have weaknesses. Let me listen. This is a brand new church, right? We're just getting going. This is the eighth service. I've been keeping count. Once we get past ten, I'm going to struggle. But right now, we're doing okay because i got it on my fingers. This is number eight. That's great, right? Let me just tell you right now. Something will happen at the fountain of life that you won't like. That's my disclaimer. I'm throwing it out there. You're going to leave one day and say, well, I didn't go the way I wanted it to go. And everything inside of you is going to say, don't go back. Whatever you do, don't go back. You'll show them. You show them, don't go back. No, you're not going to show them. You're going to hurt yourself. That's a distraction. You know what Satan wants? He wants you to not like church. Why is it so hard to go? Do you ever wonder that? Why is it so hard to get committed to church? He's distracting you. He's distracting you from coming to church because he knows, you know what? If you do go to church and you get committed to church and then you change your life over and if you get born again saved and you become one of them, then all, uh -oh, all the people around you start becoming one of them and things change. That's right. We have to recognize the distractions that are right in front of our eyes. And Jesus, verse, let's go to verse 5. And the devil taking him up on a high mountain showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, all this power I will give to thee. He will distract you with things, with prosperity. You know, what's, you know what's happening in the United States of America right now? We are being distracted with prosperity. In other words, he wants you to think you don't need anything. I'm going to give you a truth right now. This is a life truth. Every one of us are born with an emptiness inside of us. You're born that way. And that's why we have this desire. We get drawn into the world and, and we try things to make it feel better, right? That's how I got started into alcohol and into drugs and everything else and the lust. I'm trying to fill that big old hole that I was born with inside of me and nothing would fill it up. Listen to me. If you're young right now, you think it's great and you're having fun and you're partying and life's fun and I don't have a hole I've got to fill up. No, you don't. That's right. No, you don't. You're going to come to a day where you realize that hole's still there. No. The only thing that will fill it is Jesus. Amen. Satan has the United States of America right where he wants her. In prosperity. The psalmist said, in my prosperity, I said, I shall never be moved. False confidence in prosperity. He distracts us with things. He distracts us with the fact that we think we're okay. That we're rich. Right? That we have all this stuff and we don't even really need anything. He wants to distract you from knowing there is a hole inside of you. How many times I've had people come up to me and say, I know that hole you're talking about, preacher. I felt that too. Every one of us know that hole. Whether you want to admit it or not, there is something inside of you. If you don't know Jesus, there's something inside of you that's saying something's not quite right in my life. And the best thing he can do is distract you from knowing that. You see people and you see them come in and you see them uh, maybe hear the word and, and maybe seem a little bit excited about church. And then you see them start to grow and then get to the point where God starts to ch start changing them a little bit and boom, they're gone. They got distracted. Why? Why does he want to distract you? Ask yourself that. Why? Why, why be distracted? What's the big deal? Why would he try so hard? That's what I keep asking myself. Why would he try so hard to distract us? Must be something pretty good, Laban. If he's distracted and he's trying so hard to distract us with possessions, with things. Do you know anybody that's not busy? I'm serious. Uh, people say to me all the time, man, you're so busy. No, you know I'm busy because I have to talk in front of you every week and I whine about it a lot. You're all just as busy. I don't know anybody that's not busy. You talk, oh, man, I am so busy. Huh. Distracted with busyness. So busy. How much time do we spend in our work? 
I love Jesus, preacher. That's great. How much time do you spend with him? Oh, yeah, I'm a Christian. I love being saved. That's awesome. How much time do you spend with God? I'm not talking about church. Don't start counting the minutes that you're at church. Well, Brother Mark was kind of windy last week, so I got an hour and 45 with Jesus. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about Monday morning. I'm talking about Monday at noon, Monday at 3 o'clock. You say, why well, work? Well, the work can't tell you. You can't talk to the Lord in your mind, can he? Listen, we're so distracted with everything going on around us, and none of this even matters. Satan came to Jesus and said, you know what, you're so hungry. And Jesus said, I don't even care. That's right. This doesn't matter to me. He said, let me set you up and let me show you all this power that's been given to me. By who? Us. By him. Yeah. I always got a kick out of that. This power's been given to me by you, but I'll give it back to you. <laughs> he set him up and said, look, look at all this. All this power. Man, I wonder how many Christians today say, okay, I'm in, I'll take it. He said, I'll give it all to you. Jesus, I don't need this. I, there's none of this that means anything to me. My mind is not here. I, my perspective is not worldly. It's eternal. My perspective is not in this world. It's in the kingdom of God. That's where our perspective needs to be. He wants you to be distracted from that so you can't understand how great it is. You know, I woke up this morning, and I'm getting older. Hey, that wasn't funny. <laughs> you get your house number, brother. Truth is true. I am getting older, and I felt down. Man, my knee. Whew. I'm not as young as I used to be, and I sit out there. I like, that's why I'm friends with Pappy, because he's so old I feel young when I'm talking to him. <laughs> and I sat out there with Pappy this morning, and he just turned 70 last week, and I was asking him about that. And, you know, I was just thinking, there's coming a day when I don't need this anymore. Mm -hmm. there, there's coming a day, Bernie, where, where your mind, he, he said this morning, he said, my mind is 30, but my body's 70. There's coming a day where your body won't be 70 anymore. But you see, he wants to distract us. He wants Bernie to only think about what doesn't work anymore. He wants me to only think about the fact that I have the left knee that hurts a little bit, but my right knee is perfectly fine. The fact that I can still get out of bed on my own, I can still work on my own, I can still walk, I can still run if I wanted to on my own. But instead of thinking about all the great things that God has done for me, he wants to distract me and say, hey, what about that left knee you've got there? What about that little bit of pain in your left lower back that you've got? Out there, you go and you tell people God healed you, but you still got a little bit of pain in your back. Never mind the fact I can move pretty good. Never mind that. That was a cool move, wasn't it? <laughs> but all he wants me to do is you focus on that. Focus on the bad there. Focus on the bad. So listen, he'll do the same thing with you in church. Yeah. You'll come in here and there'll be 99 blessings all around you, but Brad will sit by you and try to touch your stuff. That's what he did yeah. to me this morning. <laughs> Social distancing. <laughs> and all you'll think about is Brad touching your stuff. Oh. Right? It could be the best service that you ever had. 14 people give their heart to the Lord. A whole bunch of people rededicated. A tremendous movement of God in the church house. Everybody smiled, and you're going to leave like this. Great service, wasn't it? What's wrong with you? Brad? <laughs> it's like best sermon ever. <laughs> is that not how we are? You know what happens is Satan will go get right out in your car and he'll sit right beside you. Whoa, I thought I was going all the way back. <laughs> oh, <my faith> he'll <laughs> get right beside you and he'll say, man, wasn't that terrible? Can you believe that one thing? Listen, open your eyes a little bit wider. Why is he trying so hard to distract us? Why is he trying so hard to tell me that my left knee hurts and making me lose focus on the fact the rest of my body is pretty good? Right. Amen, preacher. Amen. Why? 
Because if he's got you distracted, he's got you right where he wants you. That's right. Because if I'll spend enough time focusing on the fact that my left knee hurts, you know what'll happen? Pretty soon I'll be walking with a limp. What's wrong, Brother Mark? My knee's bad. It's terrible. Wow, really? Yeah. That's all I can think about. If that's what happens, that's what you will do. Listen, Steph taught me this, this trick that's incredible. When we first got married, I thought she was like this bionic woman because she never gets sick. Ever. And then I realized she does get sick. But she does this really weird thing when she gets sick. I'll show it. I'm like, are you sick? Because, you know, if you are, I'm probably going to mom and dad's. <laughs> no, I'm not sick. Here's what she does. When she gets sick, she says, I'm not sick. That's, that's it. There's no more secret. That's it. <laughs> it works. Listen, she, she just flat, she doesn't, uh, in the name of Jesus, I will beat the sickness. It's not anything like that. She just says, I'm not sick. It works. It's incredible. Instead of being a giant baby like other people I know, this guy, and all I get... And bronchitis. And my knee. Yes. That's all I will focus on is that one little thing is that Steph will say, you know what, my throat hurts a little bit, but I'm, I don't have a cough. I feel pretty good. He'll get us focused on that one thing, and pretty soon you'll think about it long enough, you'll become sick. I can be around sick people. When I still had a job a few weeks ago, I was working with Laban. He got sick. And he called me. He's like, man, brother, I'm not going to make it. I'm really sick. I hope you guys don't get it. I'm like, why are you sick? <laughs> <laughs> the rest of the song is true the rest of the day. I'm like, you have a fever? Or? <laughs> I did. The rest of the day is all I get. If I would have thought about it long enough, you know what would have happened to me? I'd have got sick. Listen, if you focus on your weakness long enough, if you let him pull you into that distraction long enough, he'll have you right where he wants you. Verse 6, the devil said unto them, All this power I will give thee and the glory of them that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will, I will give it. If thou, thou wilt, will worship me, and shall be thine. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee in behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And he brought him to Jerusalem, and set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from hence. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over thee, and to keep thee. All right, if you didn't hear me at all, I want you to hear me on the last point. He will distract you with false teaching. This has been his M.O. from the very beginning of time. That's right. That's right. There's a garden. There's Adam. There's Eve. There's all these wonderful trees in the garden. There's one tree that they cannot eat from. That's the only rule that they had. And what did Satan do? He used scripture. And he twisted the truth all around. You won't surely die. You see what he did? He looked in and he realized that Adam and Eve thought that God meant that you're going to eat this and whoosh, you're going to die. Yep. And he twisted it around. That's right. He said, they're thinking that he meant, and so I can tell them this, and I can twist this truth down just a little bit, and I'll have them right where I want them. He will distract you with false doctrine. He will distract you with false teaching. This is happening around us everywhere. That's right. People are stepping away from the Word of God and stepping more into the world. And what we're doing is we're using little bits of Scripture to try to tweak that around. Right. I have a zero alcohol tolerance. That's where the pastor of this church stands. Mm -hmm. right. Oh, it got quiet there. Oh. Didn't it? <laughs> but there, a little wine is good for the stomach, creature. That is exactly what I'm talking about. That is a distraction. That is him twisting scripture. All of a sudden, when you bring up alcohol, everybody's a health nut. <laughs> <laughs> Took a minute, didn't it? 
bag of Cheetos in one hand, monster energy in the other hand. I don't agree with you, preacher. A little wine is good for the stomach. So is diet and exercise. So is broccoli. Why not a nightcap of broccoli? All of a sudden, we're concerned about our stomach? God had a, had a, a, a select group of people called the, called the Nazarites, right? And they had a rule for them. This is what Samson was. He had several rules for them. One of the rules they had is they weren't even allowed to have grapes because it was so close to wine. Listen, if God had a standard for his people that were going to be extremely close to him, the way this preacher sees it, is that's the standard he has for us. Satan wants to take that little bit of scripture and twist it all around and get us to think, you know what, we can live however we want, right? That's another one. Grace. You see what he does? He'll take one minute and he'll tell you there is no grace. He'll work both sides of this fence, all right? You guys are going to be the grace side today. Yeah, no, nope. You're going to be the grace side today. Hallelujah. Boy, I don't know. So he'll take the grace and he'll say, you know what? You're covered in grace. There's a big blankie of grace that has covered every soul in here. So now, listen, listen, I'm not God right now. Never, I'm never God. Lightning bolts. <laughs> <laughs> so now that you're covered in grace go do whatever you want right live however you want it's okay to do whatever you want you can live however you want you can drink whatever you want smoke whatever you want eat whatever you want all those things do them all it's fine why because grace has covered you you're covered in you see what he did he's he's taking scripture and he's twisting it around and he's distracting you with a lie mm -hmm. then the same time, he'll take, you guys are the works people today. So you're covered in a blankie of works. <laughs> it's a tiresome blankie, isn't it? Yeah. And he'll say to you, you've not done enough. You know, it's not enough that, that you're only going to church. It's not enough that you quit doing this. It's not enough that you're praying. It's not enough that you're reading your Bible. No matter what you do, you're going to fall short. He's taking scripture and he's, he's twisting it around. All have sinned. And fallen short of the glory of God. That's why he'll tell you. All have sin. The wages of sin is death. Use scripture right against you. But for grace you are saved. Not of works. Not of works lest any man should boast. Distracting you with the actual scripture. Because if this group of people realize no amount of works I do will ever get me to heaven, and they trust in the shed blood of Jesus Christ, they're going to change. Right. And people that are now unhappy, because let me tell you something, a works-based religion will always leave you unsatisfied. Do you hear me? Yeah. Works-based will always leave you falling short. Why? Because it's not by works. It's never by works. And he knows that this people understand, you know what, I can't live, hear me now, I can't live however I want. Maybe they'll stop for a second and realize, I don't even know that I'm saved. If they do realize, you know what, I'll show you my faith by my works. There'll be evidence of my faith. You'll see my fruit. If they'll stop for a second and realize, there is no fruit in my tree. Then they'll stop and they'll get saved. And if you take both sides of these people and they meet in the middle at the cross and they actually get saved and they're not distracted by lies any longer, you know what will happen? Revival will happen. The church will come to life again. There was a, a special forces division in World War II called the Ghost Army. Sounds pretty cool, right? <laughs> These guys must have been pretty bad. The Ghost Army. Right? That's I'm thinking about starting a little church gang. That's what we're going to be called. <laughs> you know what they were? They were actors. And they were art majors. The Ghost Army. Really? 
and they'll paint you up. <laughs> they were special forces. You know what their job was? Distractions. They had inflatable armies. They did. They used this to distract Hitler from what they were actually doing. What they would do is they had 90 pound inflatable tanks. And they would go and they would sit and they would blow up these tanks and they, they would paint pictures and they would make it look like there's a whole military base that's right here. And Hitler would watch this from the sky and say, oh, there they are. That's where they're moving in. They're going to attack here. And they would purposely set up to make him think that they were going to attack this place when really they were actual army was over here getting ready to attack in a, diff a different place. The ghost army. Their whole job was distraction. Distractions cost Hitler the war, thank God. Amen. What's it costing us? You know, I, I was thinking through this. Thinking about him distracting us with our weakness. The Bible talks about a woman that had an issue of blood for 12 years. 12 years she had to be away from everybody. She was considered unclean. For 12 years, she couldn't be around any of the other people. For 12 years, all she could think about was this. I wonder how much of her focus was on this weakness. But the Bible tells us there was a time where she quit worrying about that so much, and she looked to someone that could help her. Where for just a second, she put that behind her, and she made a step towards Christ. And we all know the story. She reached out, touched the hem of his garment, and was made whole. And I wonder, what if she would have stayed and been in that distraction? She would have died. What if when God, when Jesus called Peter, he was out there fishing, he said, hey, why don't you come with me? I'll make you a fisher of men. What if Peter would have said, nah, I'm good. You don't even have a house, man. I don't even really know you. You're just kind of walking around. I've got a business here. I've got a wife at home that I'm taking care of. I, I'm not, I can't just leave that. I can't just walk away from that. What if he would have gave in to the distractions of the business and to give the distractions of prosperity? Did he have a prosperous life after he followed Jesus? He was nailed to a cross. Was it great for him after? It's great for us. Our church is founded on, on what Peter went and did afterwards. What if he never did it? Listen, what about your legacy? Hey, God doesn't make mistakes. I want you to hear that right now. God does not make mistakes. There has not been a life given that God did not give. Yeah, this preacher is 150% against abortion. Why? God gives life. God does. Not a man and a woman deciding to do something. No, God gives life. There has not been a life made that God did not make. Amen. You are included. Every person in this church, God made you for a purpose. Right. And he has a wonderful plan for you. There's your pep talk for the day. God does have something incredible for every. I don't even care how old you are. Even Bernie at 117, God's got a plan for him. God's got a purpose for him. God made you. What about your legacy? Hey, I have three boys that are looking to me. If I give in to the distraction of business, if I give in to the, to the distraction of focusing on my weakness, I give in to, to the distraction of, of, of false teaching and think, well, I'm okay doing what I'm doing. What about them? What about them? Who's around you? Hey, maybe it's time to put yourself in the back burner for a minute. That's a problem. We're so self-centered. We live in such a self-centered generation, myself included. All we think about is me, 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 me. That's a distraction. What's going to be better for me? What's going to make it work better? What, what about the people around you? 
Satan tried so hard to keep me from God. The last year I was in the world, I was so miserable. Never felt so low in my entire life. But I parted even harder because at that, a few minutes, Anthony, while I was doing whatever, I felt better. But at the end of the night, when it was all settled down, everybody went home, and it was just me and my thoughts. I was the most miserable person I had ever been in my entire life. Why? Because God was calling me. And Satan was distracting me with everything he could. He'd say things like, don't give up those friends. Don't give up that lifestyle. You don't want to become one of those boring Christians. They don't ever have any fun. He was distracting me because he didn't want my voice being taught in the way. Because he didn't want me to become a preacher. He didn't want me standing up here for the word of God. What about you? What is he keeping you from? I have a very sound, secure, and blessed marriage. I did not have that before. He tried to distract both of us from something God gave us. Yeah, I'm just old-fashioned enough that I believe God made Stephanie for me. And God made me for her. Amen. And he was trying to distract us from that. Why? Because he knew the power that was sitting right there. What are you being distracted from this morning? Get your guitar, Chris. How's he distracting you this morning? Listen, you know. You feel it. You see it. Why not do something about it? What's on the other side of it? Why is he trying so hard to keep you from? It's got to be good. As we stand this morning.